Hey guys, it's me, Steve, also known as Sly Cooper 88 um, I'm actually going to do this video. took me a hell of a long time to actually finally edit this thing down to what it is. Um, but as you guys saw with Chris the Mount Vernon Kid, he did a video announcing Earth-112, which is the Neo-Marvel Animated Universe. And so I thought that I would actually do a video here and explain a lot of the ideas that myself, James, the Great Southern Treadkill, and Tony, um, Serpent Team 451, actually came up with. And we were up to like almost four in the morning, guys, just like, you know, shooting ideas about like story arcs and stuff. But um, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, what are we going to do with it? Biggest thing that we wanted to do and... I'm sure everybody's asking, you know, and, and anticipating, yes, guys, we will finish the Surtur arc. That's a, that was a big mandatory thing that we said. We wanted to finish up the Surtur arc, um, possibly, possibly lead up to a whole bunch of other ideas, one of them being um, eventually Clint Barton allegedly being lost in a fight with a foe and becoming Ronin. And using this new identity, going on the West Coast, and actually forming the West Coast Avengers. And this would lead to our version of Civil War, which is more a civil war between the, no, between the Avengers. And because these are all connected, this could lead to, in Wolverine and the X-Men, a possible X-Men schism-esque you know, ins you know, inspiration or adaptation. Um, but in Earth's My Heroes, we had many ideas, guys. We, um, certainly a lot of the ideas of expanding the roster, um, doing a character-centered episode on Jen Walters, um, a.k.a. She-Hulk. Um, of course, dealing with the West Coast Avengers, dealing with the idea of maybe even introducing Herc, you know, and doing, and later on doing an idea for Assault on Olympus, um, and even Assault on a New, on New Olympus. Um, we had so many ideas, you know, including actually introducing the Mandarin. I mean, we kind of went all over the place, guys, but, you know, I'll, I'll break it down for you guys as well. Um, another idea that we had is possibly introducing the Thunderbolts. I mean, we could go and I could literally go down the entire list, guys, but I think I'm going to leave some stuff off just to give you guys a piece, a little piece of meat, you know, in front of you to dangle in front of you, but... We definitely got a lot of good ideas for Earth's Mightiest Heroes and certainly, you know, adding to the Avengers mythos. I think it'll be fun. Um, and moving on <coughs> to the next state of business, which is Wolverine and the X-Men. Um, the cliffhanger at that first season. I know, guys, we were going to get Age of Apocalypse. But I think the cool idea that we were talking about is that in the second season taking a lot of the ideas one of the ideas being that colossus was going to be reintroduced to, to the team um so we're going to do that and one thing that i added to that is that well okay when peter left the school after xavier went into a coma um he was actually got word from his parents as well that his sister started showing you know mutant abilities and the reason that he comes back on the team is to get the x-men to help him find his sister and so that's a nice little way to get Magic into, I guess you could say, the animated universe of Wolverine and the X-Men. But what I also wanted with it um, was to introduce Mikael, to introduce, you know, Abyss, but also have the introduction, and I didn't share this last night, but I thought about it, but doing an episode that actually was the introduction to Havoc, and then maybe later on introduce Vulcan. And certainly introducing the idea of, actually in Wolverine and the X-Men, them meeting the Shi'ar Empire. And establishing that, yeah, the X-Men have history with the Shi'ar. And certainly, and definitely another big part, the Brood. You know, definitely in Wolverine and the X-Men, I think this second season, or at least the third season, should have the Brood. It only seems fair since those are like the big baddies. And... In the X-Men universe, but also the idea of the Age of Apocalypse, you know, really getting into that. And one of the counterpoints is that I said last night is the fact that um, future Xavier, Xavier in the future, sacrifices himself. But we kind of establish, okay, is this linked to the Professor X that's in a coma in the present? 
But one of the ideas that I also had was Forge actually getting his comeuppance as a character and them actually facing the adversary, Forge's, you know, arch nemesis in the X-Men comics. Um, but also the idea as well of possibly bringing Bishop onto the current team, like he's brought to the present and then from there actually getting Cable to stabilize the timeline and so on and so forth. So a lot of good ideas for Wolverine and the X-Men that we'll, we'll come up with. Um, and I know this is the one that everybody will be chomping at the bit for, Spectacular Spider-Man. Um, what are we going to do with Pete? Um, well, certainly because, keep in mind guys, these are all, these are for kids. These aren't like, you know, teen to dark gritty shows. These were like, you know, geared towards like kids and teens. Um, so we're going to do, in a sense, the quote unquote death of Gwen Stacy, but rather than it being the death, um, the idea is that actually, yeah, you're going to actually, I think the idea was to have Harry become Green Goblin and, you know, Gwen actually ends up getting crippled instead. She ends up being confined to a wheelchair and in a weird way, because Gwen, I think at this point would know that Pete is Spider-Man, she actually would break it off with him. At least that's what I remember. Keep in mind, guys, we were up till four, so my memory's a little hazy. But the basic idea is that, yeah, you know, Gwen more or less breaks it off with Peter, if I can recall correctly. Um, but yeah, you know, that was an idea that James actually came up with. He came up with the idea that, you know, yeah, instead of like actually having Gwen be, you know, be killed, why not actually just cripple her? Why not just put her in a wheelchair? And certainly, guys, taking a lot of the other season three ideas, um, Cletus Cassidy becoming Carnage. Um, that will be more like the season ender, of course, you know, introducing Matt Gargan and having him become the Scorpion, um, having an internal feud between the Sinister Six, you know, all these different ideas. And certainly one idea is adding a new twist on one of Spider-Man's supporting characters, which is the Prowler. And then even an idea with Miles Warren of even trying to do you know, this show's version of the Clone Saga, but one of the interesting side effects of this is that it's not just, you know, introducing, you know, Kane and Ben Riley and stuff, but one of the interesting ideas was actually to have a Latin kid get infected with Pete's blood. And, you know, let's just say that that leads to a character that has also taken the role of Spider-Man. So, you know, wink, wink and nod, nod. Um, and also tapping into like, you know, potentially, you know, spectacular Spider-Man's, you know, version of the, the new warriors and whatnot, you know, a lot of, a lot of cool ideas for spectacular Spider-Man guys, a lot of it to throw out there. Um, but let's go into the spinoff series that would come from each of these and more so Earth's Mightiest Heroes here. The first one that you see, of course, um, is Captain America. Okay, why am I showing Cap? Well, well, Tony actually came up with the idea of doing a Cap cartoon series. Because in the 90s, guys, Saban actually came up with the idea to do a Captain America cartoon. You can actually look up for it on YouTube. Um, but what we did is that, it, but what Tony suggested is why not spin it out of Earth's Mightiest Heroes? And of course, have it be kind of like, you know, a la Ed Brubaker's run where it's like it's stuff in the past but stuff in the present. Um, and it's going to be called Captain America Star Spangled Avenger. So this is going to be more or less like solo adventures for Steve. Um, with, you know, guest starrings of like, you know, Falcon and, you know, Bucky as Winter Soldier and Bucky back in the day. And honestly, guys, I jumped right on this because I think that it's a good idea. And especially concerned that we're spinning this out of Earth's Mightiest Heroes continuity. I think it works for Steve. I think it'll add a lot more depth to his character than what we had in Earth's Mightiest Heroes. And also, guys, I think it'll be a good jumping point, not just for Avengers, but I think for Captain America as well, to introduce maybe some other villains. Like, maybe introduce the idea of, yeah, Zemo actually had a son, you know, Helmet. Um, introduce the idea of, you know, inter also introduce the idea of showing characters like the Machine Smith and, you know, even having him maybe battle Armadillo. Um, having him definitely face, you know, Flag Smasher. You know, all these different villains that you would associate with Cap, you know, if you don't want to introduce, if we don't want to introduce him in Earth's Mightiest Heroes, then we can most certainly introduce him in this, you know, pitch, you know, this idea. 
Um, and I think that it works. And I think, and plus, this is Captain America. This is Steve Rogers. If there's anybody who more than deserves to have his own cartoon, I think it's this guy. But then again, there's one other Avenger who actually was supposedly, and this was right around the time of the first, you know, cinematic universe movie, um, that he was going to have his own cartoon as well. And we're going to spin that out of Earth's Mightiest Heroes as well. And that, of course, is none other than the son of Odin himself, you know, the god of thunder, the thunderer. Um, you know, the owner of Mjolnir himself, yes, the mighty Thor. You know, and the idea, and yeah, it's like they also had an idea to do a Thor cartoon and kind of tie it into the Chris Helmsworth, you know, movies. But we instead decided to spin it out of Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Um, and instantly I came up with the title. You know, no if, and if, you know, no but if, ands, or buts about it, I wasn't going to compromise on the name. Because I thought that it was too perfect, and it's a great throwback to what Stanley and Jack Kirby did with Thor back in the day. Um, it's going to be called Thor Tales of Asgard. You know, I like the name, I like the title, it's like, that. that's going to stay. And the reason why I call it Tales of Asgard, and the funny part is, despite that Thor's name's on there, it's not necessarily guys going to focus on Thor. It's going to focus on everyone in Asgard. It's going to focus, you know, some stories are going to actually be focused on Valkyrie. Some stories are going to be focused on Sif. Some are going to be focused on the Warriors 3. Some are even going to be focused on, you know, the younger days of Thor. Some are even going to be focused on the days of Baldur. And some are even actually going to include the Allfather himself. Yes, Odin is actually going to even have a couple of his own stories in this, you know, Thor-based series. And certainly, guys, yes, we will copy the Walt Simonson deal where, you know, he has this big epic battle with Surtur. It'll be alluded to in Earth's Mightiest Heroes. But I think to see the actual fight in this, you know, or at least in, like, written form, and you guys, of course, use your imagination... I think that it'll be wonderful. And plus, guys, the thing about Tales of Asgard that I think would also be great, and I told Tony and James this and they agreed with it, is that much like Walt Simonson's run, it's not going to be focused on Earth. It's not going to be on Midgard. But rather, guys, Tales of Asgard is going to take place within all of the other nine realms. So you're going to go to Alfheim. You're going to go to the Land of the Dwarves. You're going to go to Muspelheim, um, Jotunheim, you know, Helheim, all of the other you know, realms within Thor's universe. Um, so that'll be cool, and certainly one that's actually spinning off of Earth's Mightiest Heroes as well, due to their appearance in the Korvok episode, is, um, and I wanted to put a cosmic property in this, this is one of like two actually, um, I wanted the Guardians of the Galaxy to have their own, like, cartoon, their own cartoon series. And... I think that's appropriate. I think you can actually find... I certainly could find a way to make Drax the Destroyer and Gamora seem, you know, legit in this show. I can probably, like, you know, base it if I can read some panels and stuff off of, you know, Bendis' run. But also keep characters like Faye Lavelle and Adam Warlock and whatnot. Um, I certainly want to keep, you know, Peter Quill's look because I like his original look here. Um, and even t and even one of the ideas that I pitched to Tony and James was the idea of, hey, why don't we do an episode that crosses over with the original Guardians of the Galaxy team? And then maybe possibly have, say, like, you know, a few characters. Certainly Major Victory and Yondu came to my mind to actually add to the Guardians roster. Because you don't necessarily have to keep it exactly like the roster that everyone knows and loves. You can spruce it up a little bit. Put a little bit of the old with the new. Not really much of a problem I see, guys. And I'm sure most of you guys can agree with that as well. But I think also the idea that James kept pushing forward, and I can see why, is pushing the idea of maybe introducing Thanos in this, or maybe introducing a lot of other cosmic villains. Um, maybe, and you know, one of the most hilarious ideas is... You know, that made me kind of laugh is the, you know, that made me laugh was maybe them tackling Eco, the living planet, because since this is, you know, kind of geared for kids and teens, it'd be kind of funny. 
But certainly, you know, the concept of introducing nowhere would be kind of cool as well. Because, you know, the idea that they just, you know, fly around and ship, but I kind of think that in this show it would be kind of cool as if they discover, you know, nowhere, their central base. Kind of breaking a little bit from the comic continuity that Richard Ryder discovered it. More so make it to where the Guardians first discovered nowhere and established it as their base. Um, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I thought that that was kind of cool. Now, one that did spin off of Earth's Mightiest Heroes, this is probably the... The lastly one, as I call it, and when I say last, I don't mean literally like the the lastly one, but it is kind of the last one in terms of like, you know, I guess you could say the spin-offs, if you will, um, from Earth's Mightiest Heroes, but Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, okay, why does Nick Fury need his own cartoon, Steve? Well, my answer to that is, well, you know, some kids like, you know, the secret agent, James Bond, you know, super spy stuff. And plus, really, I think you can take a lot of the stuff that Nick Fury does and make it dark, but not, like, too dark to where kids can't really read it or, you know, like, actually enjoy it. And plus, I think the idea of actually taking Nick Fury and showing, you know, just how, okay, this guy didn't just become the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. just because. It's like, no, the purpose of this cartoon is to actually show why he became the director of shield why you know nick fury is the best at what he does you know unlike you know just like wolverine um and maybe even establishing playing a little bit of the ultimate comics into fury and wolverine's relationship um so i mean there's many different ways guys that we can go about it. and certainly another cool part of agent of shield is introducing the zodiac introducing that you know fury's brother is actually you know, Scorpio, um, or Zodiac, whichever you want to call it. I think it's predominantly Zodiac, but still, you know, the idea of introducing the Zodiac, the idea of upping Hydra, the idea of introducing Maja, you know, all these, you know, terrorist groups that S.H.I.E.L.D. has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that the Avengers don't always take on, I think it'd be cool. And you can always have, you know, Maria Hill cameo in there. You can always have, like, you know, you can always have, like, you know, Quartermain. You can always have Dum Dum Dugan maybe come back. You know, the, your, you know, Gabriel, a much older Gabriel Jones. So it's like there's plenty of opportunities within this to really kind of, you know, stir the pot, if you will, for Nick Fury. So, I mean, take that however you will, guys. But I thought that that was, you know, a neat idea. And Tony certainly thought that it would be interesting to try to play out as well. Now... Let's get to one that is not a spin-off, but is a revitalization. Sorry guys, I had to take a swig of water there. Throat's getting a little dry from talking so much, but one that is a revitalization of the 90s cartoon and I and all three of us agreed, you know, that this guy needed a uh, come up and of course that character is none other than Norrin Rad, the Sentinel of the Skyways. Um, the Silver Surfer, and ironically, that's the name, Silver Surfer, Sentinel of the Skyways. Um, this is a more a revitalization of, you know, the, the very short-lived, you know, 90s cartoon. This is more or less, uh, I guess you could say, a reimagining of how that series would really go. And, you know, it, not really much to it. It's just simply Norrin Rad's adventures throughout space. Him dealing with, you know, his relationship with Galactus, him having to deal with the fact that he caused, you know, quite a few deaths, killed quite a few planets, and how much that actually haunts him as a character. But also, trying without actually, like, you know, having stuff go over the kids' heads, um, but also even stuff that even teenagers could probably get into, um, is certainly the philosophy. That's certainly the biggest part of Silver Surfer's character, is that he's not... He's not an action character per se, but he's more a philosophical character. But I think, I think for the kids who want action, can balance out the action. But for the people that you know want the talky bits, you know want the inspirational bits of what makes this character so you know beloved, um, can certainly do that. So it's going to be an interesting blend of trying to not get too philosophical to the point that it, that stuff goes over kids' heads, but also the idea of 
you know, having fun with Norrin. I mean, this is a character who can go just about anywhere in the galaxy, even the universe. So why not actually play that up? Why not have Norrin in every episode go to, like, you know, different worlds like he did in the actual 90s cartoon? You know, why not talk about the philosophy of, you know, life and, you know, cherishing life, but also have, you know, Silver Surfer take a stand for what he feels is right. So, you know, I, I think I think that that's a wonderful idea, guys. And I think, and when I said that to Tony and James, they agreed that, you know, I think it's about time that Norrin got his due and, you know, actually had had something, you know, done with him. Now, one that James actually suggested, and I immediately jumped on this, um, is the idea of Daredevil doing a dare doing a standalone like Daredevil series that could that may tie into Earth's Mightiest Heroes and stuff and may not. Um, and the name, you know, kind of caught me and Tony off guard, but it still kind of plays on who Matt is, um, which it's called Daredevil Without Fear. Daredevil Without Fear. Now, not man without fear, but just without fear. Um, and one of the interesting ideas is that James put forward is, you know, concerned that this is good, that this is more marketed towards, you know, kids to read, um, is the idea of, okay, showing Matt's, you know, blindness and showing him relying on his other senses. Um, but also the idea of, well, pretty much taking what Mark, w one of the big inspirations is not so much Frank Miller, but more Mark Wade, the current run of Daredevil that Mark Wade is actually doing at Marvel is pretty much the template for what we wanted to do with Daredevil. And I was all for that, considering that on you know 2K14 I am writing Daredevil, so naturally I would I was all for that. You know, especially since I'm trying to use a lot of Wade's, you know, stuff, a lot of the stuff in his run to you know, incorporate that into the way I'm writing Matt. So I liked this idea, and I also like the potential of doing a Daredevil-esque cartoon because the idea of introducing characters like Mr. Fear and, of course, you know, revamping, I guess you could say, a much more, I guess you could say, close to kid-friendly bullseye <coughs> and Kingpin and whatnot is a little better. It's a little better than, than what... Than what other interpretations have really done. I mean, the closest that we had was what in Fantastic Four and what was it? Fantastic Four, and then there was I think Fantastic. Four. Oh yeah, Spider Man. There we go. Man, I just wasted time on that. Spider Man, the animated series, and Fantastic Four. So I think that so I, I think it's about time that Matt at least gets a cartoon to show how cool he is as well. And speaking of Fantastic Four. As you guys can tell by this picture, for those of you who never watched this series, try to find it on Netflix or whatever. But I was the, immediately I jumped on this, and Tony's never seen it. James actually has seen it, and he, you know, was all for it. Um, but yeah, guys, I wanted to bring back Fantastic Four, world's greatest superheroes. And I actually wanted to continue this where they left off with the previous seasons. Um, and that, to, and I immediately was like, I, I, I was doing cartwheels when Tony was like, okay, you know, we can do an FF, you know, based series. Because I loved this series, guys. You know, this was a great homage to, you know, the FF and... You know, really kind of like wacky anime-esque version of some of their adventures. And this is also one of the few Fantastic Four series that actually featured Diablo as a villain. So that definitely makes it all the more special. Um, you know, the Frightful Four, they faced Super Scroll, they faced Ronin, they faced, you know, the Grandmaster. And certainly the thing that made this show great too is that, and I always love this in cartoons, is superhero cameos. You know, they had, you know, they had Hank Pym, um, who had a bit of a hipster look, mind you. And they also had the Hulk. They had She-Hulk. You know, they faced, you know, Mole Man. They faced, you know, this show was everything that a Fantastic Four fan wanted. And so immediately when we were, 
looking at, you know, Neo Marvel animated universe, I was like, we have to put this on here. We have to add this to the track list. So, um, not really any current plans, guys, for what really to do with the FF. Um, certainly one potential is way, way later in the seasons, maybe, you know, Reed building the, the future foundation, but that's really about it in terms of ideas, guys, but, you know, it's like more or less, this is just tacked on here, and I'm glad that, you know, Tony actually wanted to put this on here because I felt like this would have been a great addition to this universe to add. Now, one and this will probably get, you know, Chris the Mount Vernon kid, you know, really doing cartwheels as well as anybody else. And even, to and even Tony loved the idea. Um, even though he was poor Tony, he was scrambling to write all this stuff down to keep, you know, jotting notes and, tra and keeping tracks. But I wanted this simply because I thought that it would be cool for kids. Like actually a team-based cartoon and that is, of course, as you can tell by this picture, this was the exact, like, you know, version of this team that I wanted, um, which is Heroes for Hire or Heroes for Hire Incorporated or Heroes for Hire Inc. So Heroes for Hire Inc. is another one that we wanted. Um, of course, naturally, they're led by Misty Knight and Colleen Wing, you know, the Daughters of the Dragon. And yes, you're going to have Black Tarantula. Yes, you're going to have Felicia Hardy. You know actually be on this um, just tie it a little bit to spectacular spider-man that you know yeah she's she's on this roster but certainly the biggest one Shang Chi I will I wanted Shang Chi you know on this roster concerned that he was in you know this iteration of heroes for hire I immediately told Tony I'm like I want this I want to have this version that has Shang Chi because I think that it could work. You know, I, I, I really do. And also, the thing about Heroes for Hire, Inc., and I think it's a cool idea, is the fact that every couple of episodes you can have a guest star. You can have, you, you know, you could have Luke. You could have Danny. You could have Luke and Danny. You could have, you know, Dane Whitman. You could have Jim Hammond. You know, you could have all these characters that at one point were actually part of Heroes for Hire. So that, in a sense, guys, was the premise of this. You know, it's basically, you know, Misty and Colleen and Colleen, you know, taking Heroes for Hire and, you know, they inherit it from Luke and Danny and they just kind of like take the ball and run with it. You know, they're superhero. You know, in a sense, I want to make it like a cartoon version of the A-Team. You know, when somebody has, you know, when somebody has a trouble or somebody's threatening them or etc etc you know these are the heroes that you come to for help you know the soldiers of fortune vibe um and this was one that james actually suggested guys which is and this is pretty you know this is pretty ballsy in its own right which is the idea of doing a midnight suns um this is not going to be the exact roster i just threw this on here just because it was cool but it's like, yeah, James thought about the idea of doing a Midnight Suns and, you know, having like Ghost Rider and Blade and, you know, more, maybe Morbius and possibly the idea of, you know, of, you know, Damien. Um, since you can't really necessarily, because it is a kid's cartoon, you know, you can't say, I can't allude to him as, you know, the son of Satan or, you know, as Damien Hellstrom. Um, so that, that'll have, there'll have to be a, a workaround for that. Well, actually, well, actually, you know what? Hellstrom is part of his name. You know, actually, you know what? Scratch that. Hellstrom is going to stay, regardless if it's a kid's, car, a, a kitty-based cartoon. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking more along the lines of like, you know, yeah, like, you know, 8 to 10 or like, you know, teenagers. Yeah, call him Damien Hellstrom, but not call him the son of Satan. But maybe call him Son of the Devil. There we go. And then you could maybe possibly have, you know, say, you know, you could possibly have his his sister who would be the daughter of the devil. Yeah, Damien Hellstrom, the Son of the Devil. You know, it, it, I don't know. It, that, that's something that can be worked around. Of course, you know, Man-Thing. 
you know, all these different ideas, guys, for what to do. I'm um, certainly Jack Russell, Werewolf by Night, is another is definitely another character that could be added to that roster. You know, it's like the Midnight Suns could have such a great potential as to who could be on there and who couldn't. Um, so more or less, it more or less would be like your supernatural or like monster-based team. You'd have all these characters that are like, you know, these monster or supernatural kind of characters. Um, certainly, you know, Eliza Bloodstone could be another one. You know, that, I mean, there, there's a great potential there, guys. But another idea that James threw forward, and this is going to be the more ambitious one, I must say, um, is James came up with the idea of, you know what, let's do an anthology cartoon, a la kind of in the same style of, I guess you could say, an homage to like, you know, Tales from the Crypt and, you know, all these different, oh, you know, anthology based shows, not so much like scary or horror, but just more like, you know, okay, this is a little bit darker for kids. You know, this is more like, you know, for teenagers. This is kind of more the show that will be pushed for like, you know, teenagers. Um, and that's Marvel Knights. And the anthology series of like, you know, one or two or even, you know, one and done stories featuring, um, taking inspiration from like, you know, Garth, from like Garth Ennis's Punisher and, um, you know, darker versions of like, you know, Daredevil stories. But more, more James said that he wanted to go for the characters that in kid-friendly animation, quote unquote, would, that wouldn't be able to work so well. So it'd be more like a show pushed for teens, which is, you know, characters like the Punisher, characters like Blade, um, characters like Werewolf by Night or Ghost Rider, and I'm actually all for that, guys. Because to tell you the truth, there's not too many shows that are geared towards teens that are actually animated, that are actually cartoony, so I, I can actually like this idea. And plus, you know, it actually, you get to see the darker side of Marvel without it being like, you know, blood and guts and, you know, nudity or any of that kind of nonsense. And also, it'll get a way for people to be introduced to the Punisher to where parents don't need to worry about extreme violence. Because Frank Castle's a very dark character, and especially in Marvel Knights, the actual comic line, he was a very dark character. Um, almost to the point that it was like a Max series, but I think that this could actually work, and it could especially work for characters like Blade and stuff and give them more exposure to really, I guess you'd say, be flushed out to the general audience. So Marvel Knights is a very interesting and very good idea. I can, I can definitely roll with this. And then the very last one that I'm actually going to talk about here, guys, because getting over... 30 minutes or so, but James posted, guys, an idea, and he's still trying to work out the title for it, um, similar to the, you know, Marvel Project and stuff that Ed Brubaker did, um, and he's working on multiple versions of this, or like three different versions of it, but I'm just going to lump it all together. He's creating something that he has the temporary title as of right now, he's calling it Golden Age. That's it. He's just simply calling it Golden Age. And this is more or less a throwback to, I guess you could say, the 30s and 40s. So this is going to deal with, you know, of course, some of the very first adventures of Namor. Some of them are going to deal with the formation of the invaders. Going to deal with the invaders. I'm going to deal with you know, the early days of Cap, you know, going to deal with, you know, the creation of Jim Hammond. You know, all these different ideas, guys. You know, that really, I thought was a good idea. Um, it'll get, it'll actually show people that are new to Marvel or show kids that, you know, want to learn the history of Marvel. I think this is actually kind of an interesting idea. And maybe even tell tales that in the comics when they touch upon the golden age that maybe weren't really done before. Like, you know, like, you know, the invaders, like, you know, invaders storylines that, you know, maybe Cap and a lot of the other characters kept to themselves. You know, so 
I mean, there's a great potential for that, and I think that it'll be fun. I think it'll be a, a fun way to introduce people to, you know, obscene and really funny characters like the Golden Age Vision, or even as you see there in the right, you know, yes, the Wizard. Um, but yeah, guys, I like I like this. I like all these ideas. I love, you know, a lot of what we're doing <coughs> in terms of building this. Um, and one last thing to note, this is probably going to be monthly or bi-monthly, depending on how much planning we have. So just keep that in mind. You know, this is going to be monthly or bi-monthly. And with that being said, guys, I'm going to cut off the video. So